So we were leaning, and then we're standing, and now we're following. <laughs> Four, one. Good. 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 In the valley with my Savior I would go, where the flowers are blooming and the sweet waters flow. Everywhere he leads me I would follow, follow on, walking in his footsteps till the crown be won. Follow, follow, I would follow Jesus. Anywhere, everywhere, I would follow on. Follow, follow, I would follow Jesus. Everywhere he leads me, I would follow on. Now in the valley with my Savior I would go, where the storms are sweeping and the dark waters flow. With his hand to lead me, I will never, never fear. Danger cannot fright me if my Lord is dear. Follow, follow, I would follow Jesus. Anywhere, everywhere, I would follow on. Follow, follow, I would follow Jesus. Everywhere he leads me, I would follow on. Down in the valley or upon the mountain steep. Close beside my Savior would my soul ever keep. He will lead me safely in the path that he has trod. Up to where they gather on the hills of God. Follow, follow, I would follow Jesus. Anywhere, everywhere, I would follow on. Follow, follow, I would follow Jesus. Everywhere he leads me, I would follow. Take your Bibles and turn over to Ecclesiastes chapter number 10. Ecclesiastes chapter number 10. I see you in the back row. Yeah, I see you. The light, I didn't know if you could see me very well. So. <laughs> you know that's by now, Michelle. I'm embarrassing, so... <laughs> All right, Ecclesiastes chapter 10. Um, I want to let you know there's some things coming up a little bit different on Sunday at 11. So next week, obviously, we won't have this time. We'll be all together, but it's going to be a little bit different with our family day. Uh, we'll have food and things. We'll look forward to a great time. So we won't have this, though, at 11. And then the following week, uh, the 26th, I'm going to be away uh, in Newfoundland to go visit my folks, along with uh, most of my children, my wife and eldest, Emily, will be here. The rest of us are heading to the rock. Uh, it won't be warm, so I'm not going for a warm destination, all right? I'm going to go see family, encourage, be encouraged, and uh, I will be preaching at First Baptist Church in Mount Pearl on that Sunday. And then we're into March. Can you believe it? Uh, and that uh, first Sunday of March, uh, we will have the wolves here with us. Uh, and uh, we're looking forward to a great time. They're going to be coming up here on the Friday, the 3rd of March. So we're going to have a gym night, and they're going to be there and things. I am so looking forward to them being with us. I'm so excited for what the Lord's going to do with them, move to Newfoundland and helping the ministries there. Uh, so we'll look forward to that. So on that Sunday, uh, Brother Caleb's going to be preaching for us all day. So we look forward to that opportunity. So Friday night, uh, youth and young people will be with them. Uh, so it'll be a little bit before we get back to Ecclesiastes. Say all that so you know, but it'll be a little bit before we get back to Ecclesiastes, and we're pretty close to getting done now. So we'll look forward to finishing up. I hope it's been encouraging to you. I'll be honest, this has been a major encouragement to me as I've been studying out and learning the book more. Sometimes, uh, even as pastors, you'll be like, oh, it's going to take a little bit of work to figure that out. And we don't put the work in just like everybody else. Uh, but I certainly have glad that I put the work into studying out and learning it. It's been super, super helpful to me. And I hope it has been to you as well. All right, so Ecclesiastes chapter 10 and verse number 1. Dead flies cause the ointment of the apothecary to send forth a stinking savor. So doth a little folly him that is in reputation for wisdom and honor. A wise man's heart is at his right hand, but a fool's heart at his left. They also, when he that is a fool walketh by the way, his wisdom faileth him. And he that saith to everyone that he is a fool. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for this time. Lord, thank you for the beautiful weather, the sunshine, it's encouraging. 
Lord, I pray, Lord, that we'll be encouraged by your word. And Lord, as specifically we see about not being a fool, Lord, help us to be wise in this day. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So this chapter, Solomon just hits it about not being a fool. He talks about folly. He talks about wisdom or not being foolish. So what do you think the word folly means? That's mentioned twice, but foolish, foolishness is mentioned other places, or fool. What do you think the word folly means? So I got to get a better coffee. So I, playful? Okay. Not appropriate time to be playful, but yes. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, that you could, yeah. Anybody else? Foolishness. Foolishness? Yeah. Oh, we got three. Anybody else? Yes. Yes, it can, yeah. So the idea from the dictionary, the state or quality of being foolish, okay? A lack of understanding or, or, or sense, okay? Not understanding what's happening. The fool and his foolishness is mentioned, like I said, numerous times in this chapter. In chapter 1, uh, Solomon lays down the basic principle that the folly creates problems for those who commit it. And you know what? The folly affects more than just the person who commits it, too, but they are the biggest, of, you know, the ones who are, feel the effect more than anybody else. He compares a good name to fragrant perfume that was back in chapter 7. So he gives us a very vivid Im image here, right? Uh, a dead fly in the perfume. A folly is to the reputation of a wise person. So you don't want something dead in your perfume, right, ladies? That's not the way it goes about. That's not what you're going to wear. That's not appropriate. That's not right. So folly is to the reputation of someone who's wise. And you've probably known someone who's, in your mind, was wise. They did something fo foolish, folly, like, this makes no sense. This is not right. You know, this. So a wise person is to stay away from folly, foolishness. Now, why is one person foolish and the other wise? Anybody? Balance. Balance? <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's, comparison. It's, uh, it's comparison, absolutely. But what makes the difference? Why is one person, I'm sure every one of you here knows a fool, someone who's foolish anyway. Why is that person foolish and then this person over here wise? Believe in instruction? Believe in mm hmm. Well, that's definitely it. So it goes to the matter of the heart. It's a heart issue, all right? Uh, and what's going on in the heart? Any condition, the uh, way your heart is inclined. A wise man's heart is as, as his right hand, but a fool's as his left. Uh, so Psalm's referring to what's controlling the issues of life. Uh, we put this on the, our Bible verse on our website on Friday, Proverbs 4.23. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life, all right? So this statement, though, is really referring to some uh, ancient uh, thought patterns, okay? And they're not wrong. The right hand was the place of power and honor, all right? You're, and we still use it today. We might not understand it. We use a lot of terminologies today that are based on the past, all right? Do you know why you take your hat off when you go in someone's house? Besides respect? <laughs> Uh, what back was actually based in the days of the medieval knights. And if you came in with your helmet on, you were at war. Took your helmet off, I'm here for peace. That's how, that's, that's lineage to it. All right. Uh, and then uh, why did your, why did your mom always tell you, keep your elbows off the table? Pretty close. Back in the day, tables were not mass-produced. So a table was made by whoever was in the house, and if it was anything like me, it wouldn't be much of a table. So you put your elbows on it, all the food would come to you. Now, I didn't live in the old days. That's what I was told. All right, so the idea, a lot of the things that we have today in our world that we use, we just think is normal, it, it's traced back to there. Okay, so the right hand, honor, uh, and my right-hand man, I've used that with Pastor Matt. He's my right-hand man. Where is Pastor? Where is my right-hand man? <laughs> anyway, I think he's in the office. Oh, he's right there? Okay. 
Uh, so the idea is that we know that as to be a place of honor, respect, someone we trust, okay? Uh, and it's, it's, used, it's used all the time. Now, we don't say much so much about the left hand, though, okay? But in ancient times, the left hand represented weakness and rejection. And actually, there's a mention of that in Matthew chapter 25, verse 33, and he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left, okay? So that, that's just some information that's just helpful, okay? Uh, and many considered the left to be unlucky. Now, Christian, I talked about this last time, Christians, we don't operate in the realm of luck, okay? Uh, the soul uh, is, is going to be wise. It's the determination of the heart. I want to be wise. The Bible tells us to seek wisdom, and God will give it to us liberally. So we need to seek it, okay? The, the left hand, the wrong side, will gravitate towards what is wrong. It will, that's the way it's going to go. It's going to gravitate that way. Get into trouble. Ecclesiastes 2.14 the wise man's eyes are in his head, but the fool walketh in darkness. Does anything good come of walking in darkness? How many times have you thought, oh, I can make it to the bathroom in the dark? <laughs> Boof! The bed. Boof! The end table. And then there's all kinds of agony in your shins or your toes. And then, you know, no, nothing. I mean, that's a really minor comparison to what we're talking about, how you can get into something really bad. All right? So, walk in the dark, and I myself perceive hostile that even that one event happeneth to all. So people who care will try and correct the fool. I've done this in ministry. I've tried to help someone who's acting foolishly. I'm not saying they're all out and out fools, but they're acting foolishly, and you try to help them, and they refuse. You know what they're, you know what they're telling you then? You know what they're demonstrating? That they are a fool. Because a wise man will listen to rebuke. A wise man will listen to correction. A wise man will say, oh, that's a good idea, or... I'm not sure about that, but let me think about it. Where the foolish will just blow it off, blow off the person altogether. All right, so let's down verse number four. If the spirit of the ruler rise up against thee, leave not thy place, for yielding pacifieth great, pacifieth great offense. There's an evil which I have seen under the sun as an error which proceedeth from the ruler. Folly is set in great dignity, and the rich sit in low place. I've seen servants upon horses and princes walking as servants upon the earth. So we see the foolish ruler here. If there is one person who needs wisdom, it is the ruler of a nation, right? They, they need wisdom. This is not an easy job, okay? This is a really technical job. It's hard. And so they need wisdom. When God asked uh, Solomon what gift he wanted, he was really correct to ask for wisdom. I mean, that had such a huge impact on himself. And they find that in 1 Kings chapter 3 uh, that he asked about that. But that, because of that request, that changed Solomon's life, and it greatly impacted the life of Israel. Your wisdom affects more than just you. And I'm not talking about asking the Lord to give you biblical wisdom. If you live biblically, you have biblical wisdom. It impacts your life, and it will impact those around you. All right? So we need to understand that. Wisdom affects more than just a wise individual. But if a ruler is proud, he probably will say and do foolish things that will cause him to lose respect of his associates. That's referred to in verse number 4. Okay? The picture here is of a proud ruler who easily becomes upset. Uh, and uh, Now, that doesn't give the servants or the associates a free pass to act like fools themselves. You know, we're never uh, commanded, we're never to be like a fool. Even if we're totally surrounded by fools, and that's a hard place to be, but we're not to be like a fool. We are to be wise. All right, and live uh, righteously and show truth and bring peace. Uh, Proverbs 16, 14, But the wrath of a king is a messenger of death, but a wise man will pacify it. So don't we live in a world tick for tat? She did this, I'll do that. He did this, I'll do that. A wise person stops that cycle. They did it, I will not. I will show peace. Uh, now, that's not to say that we don't uh, cr try to correct the situation, like talk to the person, whatever, uh, and try to make rectify things, but we do not continue the escalation of the uh, situation. We try to get it right. That's a wise person, all right? That's what a, a fool will continue it to go further. All right, down to verse uh, number 8. He that diggeth a pit uh, shall fall into it, and whoso breaketh an hedge, a serpent shall bite him. Whoso removeth a stone shall be hurt therewith. And he that cleaveth wood shall be endangered thereby. If the iron be blunt, and he doth not wet the edge, then uh, must, he be, uh, must he put to more strength, 
but wisdom is profitable to direct. Surely the serpent will bite without enchantment, and a babbler is no better. So we saw the foolish ruler, now we see foolish workers. I believe here Solomon is describing people who attempt to do their work and suffer because they're foolish. Have you met people like that, workers? That you work with them and they're foolish and they cause problems. You know, and it's just, <laughs> they're the major victim. Their foolishness causes them the most. And uh, we see here a man who dug a pit, maybe a well, and he falls into it himself. In he goes, plunko. Uh, he, he lacked wisdom. He didn't take the proper precautions or things of that nature, all right? He, w- he wasn't watchful. Verse 9 talks about the transportation to the quarries and the forest where careless workers are injured, cutting stone and chopping up logs. And verse number 10 is a great picture of the foolish man and his element, all right? Trying to split wood with a dull axe. That is foolish, all right? Useless. Uh, it's horrible time management. You will be exhausted way quicker, and it's not a wise way of work, all right? Uh, so a wise worker, if he finds a dull axe, will pause, and he will sharpen that axe. That's the proper thing to do. Uh, when we lived in Newfoundland, um, I had, well, we lived in Deer Lake. We had a, a wood-burning furnace, so we would, our primary heat was wood. Okay, so every spring, uh, the local guy that we bought wood off would come to my side of my yard and dump off four to six cords of wood in eight-foot lengths. So then I would have to get out the chainsaw and cut those pieces in the right length to get into my wood stove. And there's times where we had to uh, chop the wood to make sure it would fit because it was too big around to get inside the, the wood stove and things. Uh, so I understood very much the importance of having a sharp blade. Okay, A sharp blade made short work where a dull blade made much work and way longer work. You know, And at the end of the day, you were way more sore than you should have been. You could have done it way better. Uh, so don't work harder, work smarter. All right? get, do, do the things that you need to do to help get the work done quick and right and smart. Do it. Do it do right. That's, that's the whole idea. And uh, I'm, I, I don't know how many lengths of cords of wood I've cut over the years. And that sharp ch- chainsaw is a game changer. You know, I remember this one guy I would help. He helped me one time. I wish he would help me every time. He wasn't particularly good at throwing chunks of wood or chopping chunks of wood or bits of wood, but man, he could sharpen a blade. I'm like, I want you here to sharpen my blades all the time. You're worth your weight, and he was a bigger lad. <laughs> You're worth your weight in gold to be in sharpening my blades because it makes the work so much better. So don't work harder, work smarter. Verse number 12, the words of a wise man's mouth are gracious but the lips of a fool will swallow up himself. The beginning of the words of his mouth is foolishness, and the end of his talk is mischievous madness. A fool also is full of words. A man cannot tell what shall be and what shall be after him. Who can tell him? The labor of the foolish wearieth every one of them because he knoweth not how to go to the city. The foolish talker. In Proverbs, Solomon has much to say about the speech of fools. Uh, In verse 12, we see here uh, that they're destructive words. The words of the foolish are destructive. The words of the wise are gracious. Uh, They they listen uh, to the person who's speaking. Uh, They they kind of bring in the whole situation. What's happening? What's occurring? They're they're applying wisdom. They're applying knowledge, all right, trying to figure out the fool blurts out everything that's on his or her mind. It's just like, blah, 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 blah. it's all out there. And um, there's been times in my ministry here and out east that people have said stuff, and I've come to them after, I'm like, why, why did you say that? You know, I'm, uh, and they're like, oh, it's just who I am. I'm like, you need to change. <laughs> because that's horrible. What you just said was not very nice. You know, uh, so the reality is we need to make sure. So uh, a fool is wise when he controls his or her mouth. The idea is that we're controlling or watching out what's being said. And, and we, we're, we're making, taking into account that our words can hurt people. So the foolish tends to hurt others. 
The scripture tells us destructive words are like weapons of war. Uh, in, verse, in Proverbs 25, 18, it says, A man that beareth false witness against his neighbor is a maul, a sword, a sharp arrow. I mean, that, that's some strong words that, you know, when we bear false witness. A fire in James chapter 3, a poisonous uh, beast in James chapter 3 as well. So we need to make sure that we are careful with our words. Individuals may try to hurt others with lies, with slander, or angry words. But you know who hurt gets hurts the most? Is the person who says those things. Okay, so um, what, what does a lie mean? I, I said to, uh, I'll come up to someone and say, you lied. Bert, you lied to me. What am I saying? He told an untruth, right? He told me he was going to make me breakfast. He didn't. He lied. We're no longer friends now. I'm not saying that. All right, so it's an untruth. So what does slander mean? I hear lots of... I hear lots of slander. No. <laughs> Anyone nice and loud? Saying something against somebody? Yeah. Yep. Defaming. David is a lazy good for nothing. I'm not, I'm not saying that that's true, but I'm using, for example, that would be slander because he's not. All right? The, so it's a, true, a lie and a slander are different. They're both wrong, but we need to understand what these words mean. So we need to watch out for whosoever keepeth his tongue and his tongue keepeth his soul from troubles. This little rascal here gets you in so much trouble. All right? So we need to watch out for it and be careful with it. Uh, verse 12, uh, so we see the use of unreasonable words. The fool says, says things that don't make sense. Have you ever met people like that? Don't raise your hands if you have, but I've met lots of people who don't make any sense. The longer they talk, the crazier the conversation is. I'm like, I don't, and I try to be patient individual, right? I understand my position. I understand I'm a pastor. I show compassion and can be gracious, but sometimes I'm like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Where are you going? And the uh, more goes, the foolish it gets. It's, it's, I have done it. I have walked away from conversations. Because I don't understand where you're going, and it doesn't help me to know what you're trying. I mean, you're not acting properly. So in my travels in ministry, I've met people, all kinds of interesting people. I remember this one time I was flying out east, and I met a lady who was involved with agriculture, but she was trying to help crops be more resistant to cold weather like we have here in Canada. And she, I can't remember all that she does because I don't even understand it, but it was a really intriguing subject that this is her work, and that's how she was trying to help. Uh, she was here in Ontario. This was like 20 years ago, maybe. And she, I still remember how gracious she was to me to tell me how it all worked and things. I had a great conversation. She was not a fool. Then another time I remember it was here in Pearson. I was going back to, uh, I think I was going back out east. I can't remember for sure. Uh, but I sat down next to a guy, and uh, I was reading a book. I can't remember what the book was now. But he goes, oh, I've read that book. It was, I don't know, it was historical, nonfiction. I don't know. I can't remember. But at any rate, we started talking. And I come to find out that he was a fisherman from Newfoundland. Uh, obviously, right off the bat, you know, we had a great time and having a chat. But he was one of the nicest people I've ever met, like just clear out of blue. And then he said, you ever come to my town? This is where I live, and I'll give you some fish. I mean, like feeding my food addiction, right? I mean, this guy's great. So, but then I, you know, this other time, past May, this past May, I went out to Newfoundland to visit um, my aunt who was in the hospital. I was on the ferry. So some of the young people who were with me this summer were on a ferry too. So when you get ready to dock, they tell you to leave your cabin, leave the areas that you would sit and kind of wait in this area. Then you would proceed to your vehicles when the boat has completely docked. So sometimes it takes a few minutes uh, before they're all finished docking. And usually you want to get off the boat as fast as you can, right? You're not hanging out. You want to get off. So I'm sitting on this little stool. Truck driver sits next to me. We start talking a little bit. And then... In walks the biggest blowhard I've ever met in my life. He's like, oh, yeah, 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 boys. I mean, I don't even understand half of what he was saying. And I'm almost kind of like, I don't, I don't know this guy. <laughs> he was sitting, standing right next to me. And he was foolish talk. I mean, the verses I just read for you, I witnessed. In that guy standing there, and he was 
So foolish. It was unbelievable. But you know what I noticed? So I noticed people gravitating to him. Who would gravitate to a fool? Other fools. You know who I... And then there was other people who were like... And I can't say they weren't all fools either, but they were, they were being wise, right? They were getting away from the fool. And listen, that's just not happening out east. That's happening everywhere. There's fools everywhere in our lives, all right? So we need to understand who they are and avoid them. We don't need fools in our lives, all right? Uh, verse 14, we see uncontrolled words. The fool is full of words, it says, without realizing he's saying anything. They're always walking, talking, running their mouth off. And it's interesting, um, actually, it's verse 15, he doesn't even know how to get to the city. He, he has a problem, all right? He can't control that member. That member is in control of him. And uh, we sh- we're told in, in James chapter 3 to control, if we're masters of our tongue, uh, you know, we're being wise. We need control. Uh, and watch out for ourselves. And uh, the fool keeps talking, always talking about himself. And that guy I mentioned just a moment ago, man, he was so full, boasting about himself. I'm going to be here today. I'm going to be here tomorrow. Um, no, you don't know. You don't know what today holds. Let alone tomorrow. Don't boast yourself of tomorrow. You don't know. All right. And then verse looks like on verse 16. Woe to thee, O land, when thy king is a, ch- uh, a child and thy princes eat in the morning. Blessed art thou, O land, when the king is the son of nobles, and the princes eat in, well, eat in due season for strength and not for drunkenness. By much slothfulness the building decayeth, and through idleness of the hands the house droppeth through. A feast is made her for laughter, and wine maketh merry, but money answereth all things. Curse not the king, no not in thy thought. And curse not the king in thy bedchamber, for a bird of the air shall carry the voice, and that which hath wings shall tell the matter. So we see here foolish officer Solomon. So I talked about the rulers. Now he exposes the folly of those who are underneath the rulers, the officers, who are supposed to be implementing the plans of the rulers, okay? Uh, we see speaks, uh, verse 13 speaks of indulgence um, around that's happening. If the king is immature and foolish, the people he'll gather around him will reflect that same immaturity, that foolish tendencies, and they will take advantage of the situation. You mark it down. You hang around with fools, you'll be taken advantage of. Because that's the action of fools. All right? The Bible's really clear that we need to stay away from fools. Don't go near them. Don't be one, don't be near them. All right? Real, real leaders, uh, and now we're speaking, because this passage of Scripture is really referring to physical leaders in, in nations and things. Uh, real leaders use their authority to build, right? That's the idea. The re- leaders, the, the build, to lead, while those who hold the office use the nation to build their influence or build their bank accounts or build their fame, all right, real leaders say, hey, it's not about me. It's about, I've got to help the nation. Those who are being foolish are like, hey, it's all about me. I want to be better. Help me, help me. They, hey, listen, how many times have we heard of investigations in our own country and countries around the world where the law officials or the law has in, uh, investigated and said, hey, you use public funds for this? That's not right. So, they're, they're, I mean, I, know just, I understand mistakes happen, but they knew that this was wrong. Uh, I mean, Parties in hotels, parties in airplanes. We've heard all those things. Uh, so uh, we need to understand that you know, their job is, and you as a leader too, in your own realm, at home, at workplace, you're to, you're to lead. You're, you're to help build up your team if you have a team. You're there to encourage, to go forward, to see the project f- uh, finished. A little side note, I believe we have the leaders today. I'm referring specifically to Canada. I believe we have the leaders today because of God's judgment on our country. I honestly believe that. Uh, I, and that's just my own personal opinion. You can just totally disagree with me. That's fine. I don't have a problem. But that's, you're not going to change my mind on it. Uh, that we have the leaders we have today because of God's judgment on our land. There is wickedness in our land. Uh, and verse number 18, we see incompetence. By much slothfulness, the building decayeth, and through idleness of the hands, the house droppeth through. So... These foolish officials are so busy with enjoyment, they have no time for the actual labor that needs to take place. And because the leaders are not there, the officers are not there to implement the plans, 
guess what happens in the organization? There's total chaos because nobody knows what the other one's doing. It is total chaos, and we see that the building decayeth uh, and the uh, idle hands. My grandmother would say idle hands are the devil's workshop. That's what she would say all the time us growing up. Uh, but the idea is that nothing good happens from that situation, all right? So there's, again, there's a difference between those who are in office and those who merely hold an office. The mature leader sees the responsibility as privilege. Okay, the mature leader sees the responsibility of leadership as a privilege, whereas the immature person sees the privileges and ignores the responsibilities. All right, and we, again, we can take that and apply it to every aspect of our life, just not in the realm of the political office or those who are ruling in the land. All right, verse number 19, uh, we see indifference uh, revealed to us the personal philosophy of these foolish officers. They eat, they drink, eat and drink all they can enjoy. They're indifferent to their responsibilities, and they don't care about the people below them. These these rascals, that's what I, when I read this scripture, and I, like I said, I read it through as a study, and, and these, these are rascals. They don't care about anybody but themselves. They're fools, too. All right? And, and they don't care. And uh, sometimes we've met people like that, or we see people like that, and that really grinds on it. It does me, anyway. It really grinds on me to see people like that. And uh, we, we wish that there would be uh, fair judgment, you know, that the wheels of justice would get them or whatever. But hey, listen, no one's escaping God's judgment. Nobody. They can have all the ins and outs figured out here on earth, but they don't have all the ins and outs figured out in eternity because there's only one in, and that's Jesus Christ. It's only through Him. So, you know, that's, that's the reality. of. And then the last part of that verse there, in verse 19, talks about money answereth all things. Uh, it's referred to money. Uh, money is a persuader, isn't it? especially to the fool, especially to the fool. And then the last verse, verse 20, the fool has no discretion. The saying, a little bird told me, I think comes from this portion of Scripture, right? Uh, the key, curse not the king, no, not in thy thought, the curse not the rich in thy bedchamber, for a bird of the air shall carry the voice, and that which hath the wings shall tell the matter. So imagine a group, okay, of officers. They're having their private time, you know, they're in their own place, and rather than toasting the king, the king has given them positions. And positions that are desirable by most people in the kingdom. They would want that. They are getting paid good. They have all kinds of privileges. But rather than toast the king for the privilege to serve, they're roasting the king. They're roasting. And they're cursing him. And they think themselves secure, but some little bird passes along what was said and then there's punishment, and more often than not, removal from that post occurs. Um, I can recall, there's a personal story about that, the little bird, okay? Uh, I had a, a fellow uh, talk to me one day about, some, about another pastor that had, something had happened, and it, it wasn't a really good conversation. I said, hey, man, did you talk to that guy about that? And uh, he said, no. I was like, well, I'm not talking about it no more because I don't feel comfortable. And that, that conversation ended. About four years later, I got a phone call from the pastor that that guy talked about. He said, did this guy say this and this and this and this and this? I was like, well, not exactly that, but pretty close. How did you find out? I never told anyone because I stopped the conversation. I have no idea how he found out. And it wasn't any people. Well, what happened is that person told other people, and now it finally got to him. It's true. It happens. We need to keep it closed. You know, if it's... What does our moms always say? If it's not good, don't, you can't got nothing good to say. Don't say anything at all. Don't, don't all moms say that? You know, it's so true. He'll keep you away from that little birdie. He's going to tell on you. <laughs> you know, so watch out what you say. All right, watch what you say. Uh, and there's going to be times when we do not respect the person in the office. And now, you know, this is all. This is referring to you know officials in the land. All right, but there's going to be times when we're going to have people in our lives that we don't respect in the office. Could be at work, could be your boss at work. That's an office. All right, but we must respect the office. You know, we need authority. Authority is God ordained. All right, just because that person is muffing it up really bad 
doesn't mean that the authority is not needed. It is needed. All right? That's why we should put support our authorities. We need to pray for our authorities. They need wisdom. Uh, they have all kinds of pressures on them as well. Uh, Exodus chapter 22, verse 28 says, Thou shalt not revile the gods nor curse the ruler of thy people. All right? So we need to watch out for it. Um, I read the following this week. A statement asks, what is best for my country? A politician asks, what is best for my party? But an office holder asks, what is the safest and most profitable for me? So just a good, it just helps us with defining who is serving who or what. All right, so we need to make sure that ourselves. I can't change the rulers in, my, in the land. If that could happen, that would have done a long time ago. And we probably would differ on who we think should be there. But the reality is we all have one responsibility, and that's to pray for them. We need to be praying for our leaders, okay? And uh, we as well need to trust God. Trust God as we go from day to day, as we do our work. Help us to do our work well. Help us to do our, well, our work with a good attitude, good disposition. You know, put a smile on your face and be amazed how many people are like, you actually wake, like working? <laughs> What's your problem? You know, the reality is we are setting ourselves up then for a good testimony for Jesus Christ, and we're not acting like the fool. We're acting wise, and that's what God wants us to do, act wise. So chapters 11 and 12, the wise king is going to bring it all together, various strands of truth he's woven through this entire book, and then shows us what God expects us to do uh, and uh, to be satisfied therein. All right, let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for this time. Lord, I pray you'd help us. Help us to live lives that are honoring to you. Help us to be wise. Lord, we live in a day and age where the foolish seem to be exalted and they are around us. Lord, help us to demonstrate godly wisdom. Lord, help us to be trusting in you and being that testimony we need to be in our homes, in our workplace, in our communities. Lord, I pray you encourage us now as we go. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. You're dismissed.